Well, it's Watches and Wonders time again, and a compulsory topic for every YouTuber is Rolex. What did Rolex do? What did it mean? Blah, blah, blah. Once again, who am I to stand in the way of tradition and not make a Rolex video? One of the things I'd point out is I'm kind of a Rolex outsider. I don't own a Rolex. I don't want to own a Rolex. And so that means I, I avoided a lot of the excitement in the prediction phase. I didn't spend a lot of time like cr trying to go through teasers and everything. Um, also, I've avoided a lot of the disappointment that has set in for other people. But I do love trying to analyze the industry after the fact. And Rolex is a third of the industry. So analyzing what they've done is really interesting in terms of well, what's going on with the industry and what is the single biggest player they're trying to do. Okay, we'll get into this after the intro. I will see you then. Hi, I'm Pete McConville and welcome to my channel where I overthink, overanalyze and just geek out on watches, watch industry, watch collecting, everything to do with watches. Today we're talking Rolex post Watches and Wonders 2024. A couple of things. First off, um, a lot of people's coverage of Rolex is soured by what their predictions on Rolex were going to be or what they wanted Rolex to do. I'm a complete outsider. I have no skin in this game. So um, I've avoided a lot of that. One of the things I would say, before I get into talking about what they did, I just want to talk about four things that really get in the way of both analyzing what Rolex is doing and also predicting what Rolex is planning to do for most people. The first is that Rolex hasn't really added anything new to its catalog for decades. Um, and the changes they make tend to be pretty small, uh, little subtle changes to a dial, movement upgrades every now and then, color swaps inwards and outwards. For a normal brand like Zenith, we're talking about are they going to have a are they going to have a diver or that are they not? For IWC, it's like are we going to get this Genta inspired ingenieur or not? So for normal brands, what you're trying to predict is big stuff for. Uh, Rolex, what you're trying to do is predict really miniatite. Are we going to go to a Coke bezel or the you know, Bruce Wayne bezel? Is it going to be black and red or black and gray? Trying to predict things with that level of granularity is a mugs game. Um, you just can't get it right. The second big problem with trying to make predictions about Rolex is you've got to remember we in the watch enthusiast online community only give a crap about one about approximately one quarter of Rolex SKUs. We care about the professional line. We care about maybe a half to a third of the OPs. We care about maybe a third of the date justs. And by and large, that's about it. We don't give a shit about anything that's 28 or 31 millimeters. We only vaguely pay attention to what's going on at 34 millimeters. We don't really pay attention to anything that's gold or mother of pearl. We don't pay a lot of attention, if any, to what, what happens with gem set watches. And, if, and we don't track day dates really at all. If you go and look at what that means in the Rolex website, that means there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of Rolex SKUs we just don't pay any attention to. We don't even, when most of us aren't even aware they exist. Therefore, if we're not even aware that they exist, how can we make any meaningful predictions about them? Obviously, though, what happens is Rolex does change those things when the changes come out, and there's all these changes to day dates and 28 millimeter Rolex um, uh, date justs. Obviously, we don't. No one said anything about that. And again, the, your the accuracy of the predictions look a bit weird, but that's because, frankly, no one cares about that stuff. Three. Rolex has started doing these kind of soft limited editions, these niche products that come out of complete left field, pop up for a year or two and then go away. 
most other brands, what they do is they don't release those sorts of things at big shows. They do them through the year. But things like the Le Mans, um, the Le Mans uh, Daytona, the Palm Fronds, the, the big fat um, gold uh, deep sea, you know, that'll only last a year or two probably. It's in all – They'll probably only make a couple hundred of them. In every way, shape, or form, it's actually a limited edition. But Rolex don't present it that way, and and you kind of get trapped. There's no way any normal person could predict that. Um, It's like trying to predict Seiko limited editions. You just can't do it. Um, So, again, it's one of the reasons why we get sort of tricked when you try and make Rolex predictions. And the fourth reason why I think people really struggle to make uh, Rolex predictions is because you know they're really invested in what they think Rolex should do, either because they're, they are themselves Rolex collectors and they're the things they want to buy, or quite often because they've bought into the whole, you know, the romance, the lore around Rolex, and you know, this is who Rolex is, and this is what Rolex does, and they lose sight of hard commercial realities, the actual what's going on under the hood, and they mislead themselves. And those same things that get in the way of people making accurate predictions about what Rolex is going to do also get in the way of people properly analysing what Rolex has done, even after the fact. As I said, I'm not an insider with Rolex. I don't own, don't want one, don't care what Rolex does. For me, it is a purely intellectual um, exercise. And so I'm just going to really look at, as they say, just the facts. Okay, so with Rolex releases this year, what did we get? We got One steel watch, count it. We got a new bezel on a GMT, that's it. Fine, if you like the GMT Master before they made the change, great, there's another option for you. That's really about it. We got a gold deep sea. Kind of weird here, and your reaction to that gold deep sea kind of probably lines up with your feelings towards Rolex more generally. If you're on Team Rolex, like the guys from Hadinki and uh, Worn and Wound, what they see this as kind of fun. You know, baller is a word that's being thrown around a lot. If you're not on Team Rolex for whatever reason, then the D- Gold Deep Sea is probably a fantastic example of why you're not on Gold Team Rolex. Um, it's kind of obnoxious. So, yeah, that's that's one sort of plays into my idea in a previous video where I said, you know, like this is this is a release where people are really playing to their crowd, their home team. Rolex isn't trying to get anyone to join Rolex with that watch. We also got a Platinum 1908, which is actually really pretty and probably my favorite Rolex. In fact, I think it might be one of my favorite releases for the year, um, but really just one. Uh, we got a couple, in fact, three fancy Daytonas. They're all super expensive. They'll be pretty, they'll be, they are in all intents and purposes, limited or special editions. There's the gold uh, version of the Le Mans, which if their history with the white gold version of the Le Mans, means it'll be gone this time next year and we got two mother of pearl diamond encrusted things which personally i think are awful not because i don't like uh mother of pearl not because i don't like diamonds i just think that when you're doing all of that it's just really hard to get it right and i don't think rolex did but you know what not the target market they probably already sold them already and on top of that, we got, someone told me, 130-odd different dial variations for day dates. I have not double-checked that, but looking at all the permutations and combinations, that feels about right. Looking at those selections, look, there are some good, there are some bad, there's a whole full lot in between. And one of the things I would say is these are not necessarily new additions. Well, it is 130-odd new SKUs, but if you dive right into it, you'll find that there are other dial combinations which have vanished, so it all ends up, comes out in the wash. Now, these watches all cost a minimum of 55000 Australian, um, so they're niche products. Okay, so that's what's in, what's out. Uh, we lost the Yachtmaster 2, which I think is going to be largely unmourned. Being controversial here, I always thought that for all its tricks, it was a clever watch. Movement really did some brilliant things, but frankly, it looked like Rolex had copied Invictus homework. It was a horrible looking watch. 
And I think most people felt the same. So it's going to be, as I say, largely unmourned. We also lost what they called the motif dial um, day dates. Again, this example I use of kind of soft limited slash special editions. They pop in, they're in the inventory for a year or two, then they pop back out again. Um, so that means the palm dial and the kind of gold brick uh, flute things are gone. Okay, so before we get into what I think this means, let's zoom out a little bit and look at sort of where Rolex sits in the marketplace and what's going on with Rolex to sort of create some context for what I, th so that we can sort of better understand what's happened here. According to the most recent Morgan Stanley watch results, watch industry results, over the past two years, Rolex has increased production by about 20% from around about a million watches to 1.2 million watches. But their market share, despite that 20% growth, has only increased by 1.8% over two years. How did that happen? It's because for the first time, really since these Morgan Stanley results have been around, the average retail price of Rolex is being sold has really slowed. The growth in that has really slowed. So the the average price back in twenty nine back in twenty twenty one uh, was around about eleven thousand five hundred ish uh, Swiss francs. Now it's about twelve thousand two hundred. That's a six percent increase. That increase in average price sold is actually less, substantially less, than Rolex's increases in MSRP. So what that tells you that Rolex has been producing more watches, it has been selling more watches, but that they are cheaper watches than they've been selling in the past. This kind of macro analysis that comes from the Morgan Stanley results is really backed up by a lot of the more anecdotal results that we're hearing, where just about everyone is saying that if you walk into an AD now and are after a precious metal Rolex, it will probably be offered and it might even be worth you know, making a cheeky discount request. If you do look at one of my favorite indexes for how Rolex is doing, the Joe Michel Lady Datejust index, what you'll see is that those watches are now starting to crop up with 15, 20, 25 uh, percent discounts. Whereas at the height of the Rolex madness, you, there was no discount even on them. So again, that tells me that the the premium that the grey market has to pay to get their you know Daytonas and Submariners and GMT Masters is really shrinking. And as a result, they're now prepared to uh, offer um, discounts on the dross they have to pick up in order to get those you know, desired steel professional watches. Next up, the ongoing fall in Rolex prices in the secondary markets, well documented, lots of people talking about that. And finally, um, there's these interesting rumors that Rolex is continuing to build new facilities to be to enable them to produce yet more watches. Um, and there's no evidence that that's slowing down. Okay, so with all of that context sort of sorted, what does that mean? I think first off, it means that Rolex intends to keep growing, but it recognizes that it's going to have to change its growth model, and it's now going to grow predominantly from selling more of its inherently desirable steel sports models. In that environment, Rolex can't count on selling its dogs just because it's got Rolex and a crown on the dial. Rolex is actively clearing out the dead wood at that in the the professional line especially. Last year, we saw the Milgauss go. This year, we saw the Yachtmaster 2 go. Non-performers non are not going to get carried anymore. Rolex ADs are already noticing that they're finding it harder to sell their uh, precious metal and gem set stuff. They can't rely on bundling the same way as they were. So Rolex is going to soften the blow for them by giving them more sure things to sell. They won't make as much money, but they won't lose as much money because they'll have 10, 20% more steel sp sports stuff that is at least going to go out at MSRP with no discounts and they'll be making they'll continue to make good money. While all this is going on, this is not a time for Rolex to play with the catalog. It's trying it needs to be able to have bankable sellers. It needs to be able to increase production and not risk sort of disruptions in that production pipeline. So it it's going to 
just keep making what it knows it can sell and what it knows it can make. They're also, Rolex is also going to be looking for other ways it can sweeten the pot for its ADs and give them extra value adds in, the, in a world where they're going to find it harder to sell um, gem set and precious metal stuff, at least without discounts. And so Rolex is going to do that by making it easier for the ADs to on-sell extras. Hence, everyone now talking about the fact that you can order a bracelet, um, sort of a, an alternative Jubilee or Oyster bracelet when you now get your Rolex. You know, there's a quick... You know, it's probably a thousand bucks. The AD pockets five hundred of that straight up. That's just money in the bank for uh, the ADs. So my guess is that in the mainstream Rolex production lines, everything's going to stay pretty quiet probably until 2026, 2027. The GMT, the Submariner, the Explorer, they'll have little tweaks here and there, but nothing big. They're just going to make exactly what they've got now. As I said, very small variations, but just a lot more of them. And as a result, these announcements that we're going to see, as we saw this year, are really going to be at the top end where Rolex don't really have to make a lot of investment. As I said earlier, with this gold deep sea, they're probably only going to make a couple of hundred ever. With those day dates, they probably only make a couple of thousand a year. Those don't require massive investments. And I don't think that part of the production is changing. They're not upping it or, or doing anything fancy there. As a result, that's the area where I think Rolex is going to be making its announcements over the next couple of years, as they did this year, because it allows them to get announcements out without actually having to do too much. So anyway, that's my take on Rolex Watches and Wonders 2024. Love to hear your comments. Stick them in the comments below. Uh, I've been Pete McConville. This is what I do. See you later. Bye.